Welcome, everybody. We are back, and boy, are you in for a special treat. We have Dr. Joseph Honigman, and he's going to be talking about the silent killer today. So, Dr. Honigman, welcome back. I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to step aside and just let you get started and take over. So, thank you for being here. Thank you, Tracy. So, <clears throat> welcome, everybody, to my presentation on high blood pressure, the silent killer. Listen carefully. Now, I have both a strong personal and professional interest in this topic. From a professional interest, high blood pressure is the number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of both men and women in this country. From a personal perspective, everyone in my immediate family either has had or has high blood pressure and is on multiple blood pressure medications. And even with that, it is often uncontrolled. I too have a challenge with high blood pressure and it takes me continuous effort to control my blood pressure. And sometimes when I'm not diligent, it can reach dangerous levels. And it's then that I know that my life is out of control and it's time to make the necessary lifestyle changes to achieve a healthier blood pressure. This presentation will focus on what I've learned from having both this very strong professional and personal interest on how to prevent and reverse high blood pressure with safe, natural, effective methods. And so this is a little summary of what I do. I'm a functional wellness nutritionist and a lifestyle oriented doctor. I have approximately 40 years experience in the natural healthcare field, and I use safe, natural, effective methods focusing on optimizing the health of your whole body. My goal for you, as well as for myself, is always healthy transformation of body, mind, and spirit. I have specialized training in functional wellness and nutrition, integrative medicine, and stress management, such as relaxation and meditation techniques. I also hold a Master of Public Health degree with a major in epidemiology. My areas of focus include diabetes, cardiovascular disease, gastrointestinal disorders, obesity and weight loss, managing stress and anxiety, immune dysfunction, traditional chiropractic, as well as optimizing your overall well-being. Now, let's get back to our topic, high blood pressure. So we're going to begin with a definition. High blood pressure is the force of your blood pushing against the walls of your arteries. Can you picture that in your mind's eye? Systolic blood pressure, and we're going to use as an example, a blood pressure of 130 over 80. 130 will be the systolic blood pressure. And that's the force of the blood pushing against the walls of your arteries when your heart is beating, when it's contracting, when it's pushing that blood to the rest of your body. Diastolic blood pressure, and in our example, it's 80, is the force of the blood pushing against the walls of your arteries when your heart is at rest, when it's between beats. So, what is high blood pressure and why is it dangerous? Well, high blood pressure is when the force pushing against the walls of your arteries is consistently too high, and this can damage the inner walls of your arteries. This extra stress on your arteries can result in the dreaded inflammation and plaque buildup, a condition called atherosclerosis, which can result in clots that cause heart attacks and strokes. If the clot occurs in an artery that's going to your heart, that's going to result in a heart attack. And if that clot is an artery going to your brain, that can result in a stroke. In addition, damage to the arteries can result in weak places or thin spots that balloon out of the artery and out of the artery wall. And that is known as an aneurysm and they can rupture. And if this is a rupture in an artery going to your brain, it can cause bleeding in the brain and that can result in a stroke. Also, your heart has to work harder to push blood around your body if you have high blood pressure, and this can result in a thicker and stiffer heart muscle. 
with a thicker and stiffer heart muscle, your heart acting as a pump is simply not going to be as efficient. And this can result in heart failure. So high blood pressure is the number one risk factor for stroke and cardiovascular disease. And it is indeed very dangerous. In fact, seven out of every 10 people who have a heart attack have high blood pressure. Seven to eight out of every 10 people who have chronic heart failure have high blood pressure. Eight out of every 10 people who have their first stroke have high blood pressure. In addition, high blood pressure can damage your kidneys and that can even result in kidney failure. High blood pressure can damage the arteries going to your eye, resulting in eye damage. And that is known as hypertensive retinopathy. Okay, we've established that high blood pressure is something that you really don't want. So how do you know you have it? Well, consider that the most common type of high blood pressure is essential or primary hypertension. Unfortunately, essential or primary hypertension really don't have any symptoms associated with it. Yes, you might get a nosebleed or headaches or maybe a little lightheaded, but unfortunately, those symptoms don't occur until your blood pressure has reached dangerously high levels. That's why high blood pressure is known as the silent killer. So how do you know you have high blood pressure? Well, you're going to have to measure it. And the American Heart Association has provided these guidelines. They're telling us that a normal blood pressure is going to be less than or equal to 120 over 80. And remember the 120 represents the systolic blood pressure and 80 represents the diastolic blood pressure. Now, the old guidelines, which really, which just approximately seven years ago, give or take a few years, one or two, stage one hypertension was a systolic blood pressure between 140 and 159 and a diastolic blood pressure between 90 and 99. The new guidelines now tell us that stage one hypertension is a systolic blood pressure of 130 to 139 and that goes for all ages, or a diastolic blood pressure of 80 to 89. Hypertension stage two is now a systolic blood pressure that's going to be equal to or greater than 140, and a diastolic pressure that's going to be 90 or more. So under the new guidelines at stage one, that's like 130 to 139 and 80 to 89, you will be recommended a blood pressure lowering medication. And at stage two, if you reach 140 or higher or 90 or higher, it's almost a certainty that you will be told that you need to be on a blood pressure medication and maybe more than one. As a result of these relatively new guidelines, 70 to 79% of men ages 55 and older are now classified as having hypertension. And this includes many men whose blood pressures under the old guidelines would have been previously be considered healthy. So is that a lot? Well, I believe there's approximately 75 to 80 million people in this country over the age of 55. So for men, what are we looking at? Maybe let's say 35 to 40 million, which means approximately 20 million people over the age of 85 men alone are being told to be on a oh, blood pressure medication. That's about the population of Australia, to put it in perspective. I personally do not agree with this broad generalization of hypertension for all ages. What might have been fine for a 20 or a 30 or a 40 or even a 50 year old is not, I believe, reasonable for someone who's 65 or older. And in fact, 
different cardiovascular associations have issued different guidelines for senior citizens. So with this slide, we're looking at a comparison of the American Heart Association guidelines with the American College of Physicians guidelines. On your left is the American Heart Association guidelines, and on your right is the American College of Physicians. Both were presented in 2017. So first, we're going to begin with a definition of what they considered to be an older patient. The American Heart Association says if you're 65 years or older, you qualify. The American College of Physicians say if you're equal to or greater than 60 years, you qualify. On the far right is the European guidelines, and you can go back and look at these, but we're going to concentrate on the American guidelines because that's what we have to deal with. Now, what we're looking at is the blood pressure threshold for initiation of pharmacotherapy under the American Heart Association guidelines. They say that if your blood pressure reaches a systolic blood pressure of 130 or more or a diastolic blood pressure of 80 or more, you should be on a drug. While the American College of Physicians, their guidelines are less. Stringent. They're telling you or telling us that you don't need to be on a drug until your systolic blood pressure reaches 150 or more or a diastolic blood pressure of 90 or more. Now, is 150 ideal? Is 149, 148 really a good blood pressure? Yeah, it could definitely be better. But what they're saying is the risk of taking drugs in this situation kind of outweighs the risk <clears throat> of having a high blood pressure. So now they give a blood pressure target range. And with this, they're saying, look, you got to do whatever it takes to get to this range. And the American Heart Association says, we want you to get to less than 130 as a systolic blood pressure and less than 80 for diastolic blood pressure. And that doesn't matter what age you are. So if it takes one drug, two drugs, three drugs, four drugs to get there, that's their goal. With the American College of Physicians, they're saying, now, wait a minute. If you're 70 years old, if you're 68 years old, we're looking for a target of less than 150 if for the systolic blood pressure and uh, 90 or less for the diastolic blood pressure. That's quite a difference. I personally agree with the American College of Physicians. So what if your blood pressure is at 130 over 80 and we're going with the American Heart Association guidelines? You go to your medical doctor, your medical doctor takes that range. And, you know, depending on who they are, they may say, well, you know what? This isn't horrible. We're going to give you a little time to change it. And they give you maybe three, four months to change it. <clears throat> They'll give you some lifestyle advice, but mostly it's going to be a watered down advice. They're going to say to you, look, this is what you need to do. You need to eat better, you know, eat more fruits and vegetables. Don't smoke, exercise more. And hey, you know, you got to manage your stress. But there's really no meaningful guidance. And if you go ahead and try it and fail, well, guess what? They want you on the drug. So how did the American Heart Association guidelines get started? Well, it was mostly based on this study called the Systolic Blood Pressure Intervention Trial. And what the study found was that using three drugs to reduce your systolic blood pressure to 120 was a little better than using two drugs to get it to 140 or 130. So was it true for these patients? Yes. You know, if you're in a lifeboat and you have a hole in the bottom of your lifeboat and you have two buckets and those two buckets just aren't doing the job. And I say to you here, take a third bucket. Is that third bucket better than having two buckets? Yes. It is, but are you getting to the root cause of the problem? No, 
you're not. And that's because the most common type of hypertension, which is approximately 90% of all cases, and that's called primary or essential hypertension, doesn't have an exact medical cause. And why is that? It's largely a lifestyle disorder. Are the medications better than doing nothing at all? Yeah, absolutely. High blood pressure is a potentially very dangerous problem and it can lead to an early death. However, the fact remains that achieving a normal blood pressure through drugs is not even close to being the same as achieving a healthy blood pressure without drugs. And why is that? Everybody, in chorus, because it's largely a lifestyle disorder and often can be controlled with a better diet, along with other changes in lifestyle, along with some key supplementation. I have found that key targeted supplementation can be of great benefit. So, for example, Let's look at a study that investigated approximately 27,000 individuals for six years. What the study found was that taking three blood pressure medications had approximately a 250% increased risk of stroke compared to achieving the same blood pressure without drugs. So were the three blood pressure medications better than taking two? Yeah, probably but you still had a 250% increased risk of stroke. In other words, compared to people who have a normal blood pressure without taking drugs, those who took three or more drugs still had a, a stroke risk two and a half times higher. And why? Of course, high blood pressure is largely a lifestyle disorder and it's better controlled with changes in diet and lifestyle. In addition, there are side effects that come with blood pressure. Side effects will vary according to the class of drugs that you're taking for high blood pressure, but they can include headache, fatigue, weakness, dizziness or lightheadedness, fainting, drowsiness, dry and persistent cough. In fact, the drug lisinopril is kind of famous for that dry and persistent cause. Nausea, diarrhea, heart rhythm problems, low heart rate, a pounding heartbeat, even kidney disease and failure, ankle swelling, weight gain, and decreased sexual ability, and more. So, is there a better way? Well, let's look at a study by Dr. Joel Furman. After following a whole food plant based diet for more than one year, 443 individuals with high blood pressure had a drop in systolic blood pressure of 26 points, 26 millimeters of mercury, 26 points compared to 10 with a drug. My patients have had decreases in blood pressure sometimes in as short as a few months, but it can take significantly longer. It can take many months even a year or more, depending on your individual circumstances and how long you've had high blood pressure and other risk factors that you may have. However, even if your blood pressure is taking its good old time coming down, you're not wasting your time. And that's because the lifestyle changes you make will positively impact every aspect of your life. And now my story approximately eight weeks ago, I took my blood pressure and I found it to be 170 over 110. Consider that 180 over 110 is a hypertensive emergency. So it caught my attention. I continued to take my blood pressure over the next several days and it remained in the 160s for my systolic blood pressure and it hovered around 110 for my diastolic blood pressure. This was telling me that my life was out of balance and that I needed to do what was necessary to get back into a more focused state of being. 
And so I actually did the necessary changes, the necessary lifestyle changes that I needed to get my blood pressure back to a more reasonable level. So what did I do? I took stock of my stress level. It was too high. So I did techniques to manage my stress. I also actually ate specialized foods that were targeted at lowering my blood pressure. And these foods included those that raised that those that had high potassium levels, high magnesium levels, and that were high in nitric oxide. And we'll go over those shortly. I increased my physical activity. And in addition, I used targeted supplementation. Some of the supplements that I used were Natakin Plus, which is high in natokinase, a fibrinolytic enzyme. And that will help break down fibrin. And fibrin is one of the major, or it is the major component of clots. And again, we'll go over that in detail a little later. I used another supplement called Seven Flowers. And um, <clears throat> I also took uh, COQ10, a little bit of Hawthorne, and some resveratrol. And that did the trick for me. After that eight weeks, I took my blood pressure again, and it was approximately 140 over 80. I consider that to be fine. Is it ideal? No, it's not ideal. But consider that my systolic blood pressure was reduced by approximately 20 to 30 points in eight weeks. My diastolic blood pressure was reduced by about 15 to 20 points. I was happy. Now, I'm going to continue with my changes, my lifestyle changes, because I would like to get my systolic blood pressure into the, into the low 130s. And my diastolic blood pressure, well, I'd be fine with it remaining in the low 80s. At the age of 67, 68, I'm fine with that. If it gets lower, good for me. So let's talk a little about the lifestyle causes of high blood pressure. They include, but not limited to, an excess of sodium, an excess of sugar and sugary drinks, reduced intake of potassium or magnesium, lack of sleep less than six hours per night is associated with high blood pressure, being chronically dehydrated, smoking, an increase in blood viscosity, that's the thickness of your blood. If it's thicker and stickier than usual, that can result in high blood pressure. Chronic stress, being overweight, obesity is a primary risk factor. Lack of physical activity and exercise. Excessive ca uh, caffeine, some people are especially sensitive to coffee. And certainly soda and energy drinks should not be part of your diet. Okay, well, that makes us e that makes it easy to figure out what we need to do to lower hypertension. We want to decrease sodium and sugar intake. Sodium actually increases the thickness of your endothelial cells. And with thicker endothelial cells and the wall becomes thicker, that's going to result in an increase in blood pressure. Also, where sodium and sugar goes, Water follows. So you're going to have an increase in blood volume, and that can cause an increase in blood pressure. An excess of sugar, and it doesn't take much to have an excess of sugar, that can cause an increase in inflammation in the arteries. And we definitely could do without that. We want to increase foods high in potassium, which lessens the effect of sodium. Potassium helps to relax the arteries. And in addition, potassium helps us excrete more sodium through our urine. So the more potassium you take in through your food, the more sodium you're going to get rid of through your urine. We want to increase foods high in fiber and omega-3 fatty acids. 
There's plenty of studies that tell us that people who eat high fiber diets have lower blood pressures. And of course, omega-3 fatty acids help to decrease inflammation. We want to increase foods high in magnesium. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the supplement part. Increase your physical activity. That also means increase your physical activity during your activities of daily living. Don't sit all day. Get up, walk around. Well, climb the stairs. In addition, we do want to exercise, you know, approximately 30 minutes a day for five to seven days is a good habit to get into. And finally, let's not forget about stress management. This is a very important topic. And actually, uh, this coming Wednesday at one o'clock, I'm doing a whole presentation on it. So tune in. Don't smoke. I basically, when I come to this, just say, look, everybody knows you shouldn't smoke, so don't do it. And if you can't, quit. Stay hydrated. Absolutely. Everyone knows, again, drink water. Do it. Just don't think about it. Get seven to eight hours sleep. Lose weight, especially body fat. Eat a whole food, plant-based diet. There are plenty of studies that show that excess animal protein and fat, especially coming from factory farm animals, can have a detrimental impact on your endothelium and increase foods high in nitric oxide. So guess what that brings us to? The importance of your endothelium and nitric oxide. The earliest event to start the process moving. <clears throat> Let's go over that one more time. The earliest event to start the process of atherosclerosis and plaque buildup is damage to your endothelium. The earliest event. And what's the endothelium? It's really a thin layer of single cells that line the interior surface of your blood vessels. And when healthy, your all-important endothelium synthesizes nitric oxide, which is a gas, from the amino acids L-arginine and L-citrulline, and it releases it into your artery. And nitric oxide acts as an anti-inflammatory and helps prevent platelets and white blood cells from sticking to the inside of your arteries, thereby helping to prevent plaque and blood clots. Nitric oxide also gives the inside of your arteries the smooth coating, making it easier for your blood to flow. Dr. Esselstyn, a cardiologist, would compare it to a Teflon-like coating. In addition, nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator, meaning that it widens and enlarges and opens the diameter of your arteries, and that can increase healthy blood flow. Let's take a look at a healthy endothelium. So here what you're looking at is uh, an endothelium, and uh, <clears throat> it's a single cell layer, and you're seeing red blood cells easily flowing through it. In this slide, we're comparing a healthy endothelium to one that has plaque buildup in it. Of course, the one to your left is the um, artery with a healthy endothelium. And you can see it's just a single layer of cells with plenty of room in the lumen of the artery for the blood to flow. And on your right, you're seeing plaque buildup. And now the less room for the blood to flow. At the top of the endothelium, I want you to take note of that fibrous cap because that fibrous cap is what's preventing the plaque from basically leaking its contents into the artery. And what if the plaque leaks some of its contents into the artery? You're going to get a blood clot. And again, if that clot is in an artery going to your heart, you're probably going to have a heart attack. And if it's in an artery going to your brain, you're probably going to get a stroke. So what could we do 
to help increase nitric oxide and improve the health of our endothelium. Well, one thing we can do is we can increase foods that are high in nitric oxide. And I consider all of these foods that you're looking at as superfoods for the artery. And they include arugula, beets, broccoli, cabbage, celery, collard greens, cucumber, flaxseed, kale, spinach, and Swiss chard. Once more, all superfoods for your arteries and for the health of your heart in general, for your cardiovascular system. Now let's take a look at some foods that are high in potassium and magnesium. Foods high in potassium include avocados, sweet potatoes, spinach, watermelon, white beans and lentils, tomato paste, Swiss chard, and beet greens. Foods high in magnesium are going to include spinach and Swiss chard and pumpkin seeds, brown rice, almonds and cashews, avocados, dark chocolate, black beans, and organic tofu. The ones in blue are high in both avocados, uh, spinach, Swiss chard avocados. And avocados are also going to be high in essential fatty acids. The spinach and Swiss chard are also high in nitric oxide. So if we have all of these healthy foods, why the need for supplementation? Well, because of the unique nature of reducing high blood pressure, dietary changes are often not enough. Dietary supplements can be of great benefit. They certainly helped me over these past eight weeks, along with my healthy lifestyle changes. Of course, your healthy lifestyle changes and a healthy diet are the foundation. But targeted supplementation can make the difference. Why? Because these supplements can decrease inflammation and protect and heal the endothelium. They can also help and prevent and stabilize plaque. They can help our arteries remain elastic and prevent stiffness and abnormal wall thickening, thereby helping to prevent arteriosclerosis and heart failure. They help increase nitric oxide, and they can help relax and dilate your arteries as necessary. In addition, Supplementation can prevent or reverse abnormal blood volume or viscosity. And remember, an abnormal viscosity is going to increase the thickness of your blood. And with an increase in thickness in your blood, your blood can pool. And that can result in blood clots in addition to making it harder for the blood to flow through the lumen of your artery. Next is uh, magnesium. Uh, this is the first supplement that I'm going to be talking about. Magnesium is a wonderful, wonderful supplement that I recommend everyone to take. And one of the reasons is, is, is that, first of all, magnesium is the most um, deficient mineral in the human body mineral. And it helps our blood vessels to relax, and dilate, and is vital to the ability of your arteries to expand and contract. Magnesium is also endothelial self-friendly, increasing nitric oxide, helping our arteries stay smooth and elastic, and it helps to stabilize our plaque. It's important for steady heart rhythm, and this is extremely important to your heart health. How does it do that? Well, magnesium helps to transport calcium and potassium into your cells. It helps to transport electrolytes. And these electrolytes are absolutely essential for the normal contraction and relaxation of your heart. It is also a cofactor in more than 300 enzymatic reactions needed for the structural function of proteins, nucleic acids, and mitochondria, right? We all know what proteins do. Nucleic acids is the raw material of DNA and mitochondria are the powerhouses of your cell where energy is produced. 
And we carry several excellent varieties of magnesium to meet your needs. Who are we? We are the Weiner Wellness Center. And you can call now at 412-922-9355 to get a variety of magnesium supplements at a 30% discount. Coenzyme Q10, our next, vi- our next vitamin that, we're, that I'm recommending. Coenzyme Q10 reduces inflammation, increases nitric oxide, is a very powerful antioxidant. And it helps to preserve nitric oxide. It relaxes our blood vessels, improving blood flow. And it's associated with a significant improvement in endothelial function. In fact, COQ10 helps stabilize the plaque. Remember, I told you to, in the back of your mind, re, uh, the fibrous cap that keeps the plaque intact. COQ10 helps to do that. My recommendation is one to four a day in divided doses, depending on your individual situation, how long you've had high blood pressure, do you have heart disease, diabetes, etc. We have several great kinds of COQ10. The one that I'm recommending right now is Nutritional Frontiers, a Power Q10, which is a hydrosoluble uh, chewable. And that's a highly absorbable form of COQ10. And it's the one that I took uh, during my uh, challenge with uh, high blood pressure. And also we carry the ubiquinol form of COQ10. And that is the most absorbent of all forms of COQ10. Nutritional Frontiers Natokin Plus, which contains both natokinase and serratiopeptidase. Natokinase is a fibrinolytic enzyme that will thin your blood. It will support capillary strength. It helps prevent abnormal thickening, so it improves your blood viscosity, and it supports healthy blood flow. Natokinase has been shown to reduce vessel wall thickening following endothelial injury. And serratiopeptidase is an enzyme that digests non-living tissues such as blood clots and arterial plaque. So they both help to break down fibrin. And fibrin, if it's built up in your arteries, that's not a good thing because fibrin is the number one substance that makes up blood clots. Uh, A little note here, you should not take these with blood thinners. Um, And the dose is two capsules daily between meals. With certain people, you can up that dose. I recommend seeing a uh, health professional before you do that. CircuCore. This is a great supplement to help increase nitric oxide in our body. Nutritional Frontiers CircuCore provides the building blocks, including L-citrulline and L-arginine, as well as beetroot powder to support that nitric oxide formation and to enhance overall circulation. It features a variety of other ingredients that I simply don't have the time to go over, and they act as antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, and vasodilators. I'm recommending two capsules daily. Seven flowers, a Chinese medicine remedy that's used to reduce blood pressure. It works by relaxing the nervous system and consequently reducing the stress on the cardiovascular system. The dose, two to three twice a day with each meal. Um, I took two twice a day with each meal. By the way, I want to emphasize that the uh, Natican Plus should be taken between meals. So, summary. Magnesium. And again, these are just general guidelines. Approximately 200 milligrams twice a day with food. Nutritional Frontier COQ10. It's a highly, uh, it's a chewable, hydrosoluble, highly absorbable version of COQ10, anywhere from one to four a day. Certain people can take more and others will do fine with one. And power COQ10 ubiquinol, again, the most absorbent, 100 milligrams a day. If you're on a statin, 
a statin will decrease the ability of your liver to make COQ10. So I believe you absolutely should be doing COQ10. And if you're on a statin, you should make an appointment to see me. Nutritional Frontiers Natican Plus. Again, this contains two wonderful um, <clears throat> uh, supplements and one actually more, but these are the two that I concentrated on. But remember, you can't take with blood thinners, Nutritional Frontier Circuit Core, which increases nitric oxide, and Seven Flowers. Once more, the phone number is 412-922-9355. All of these supplements are at a 30% discount. And there are many other really excellent supplements that you can take to decrease your blood pressure. So if you make an appointment, we can figure out which ones that are specific for your individual needs. And now for a summary, not everyone is going to be able to reduce their blood pressure enough through natural methods to get off of their blood pressure medications. And there may be times when the drug is the right choice. However, a whole food plant-based diet, weight loss, salt avoidance, stress control, exercise, and other lifestyle changes, along with key supplements, are the safest and most effective choices at protecting your heart and arteries and can actually reverse blood uh, vessel plaque while lowering your high blood pressure. And this is accomplished without the side effect risk of drugs. However, be sure to not reduce the risk of drug dosage on your own. You know, as you improve through natural means and your blood pressure lowers, you can ask your doctor to reduce the dosage of your drugs and possibly get off of them entirely in a safe way. So I've helped several people reverse their high blood pressure and be able to reduce and for some even get off all their blood pressure medications. So if you're looking for a lifestyle solution that will not only result in a reduction of blood pressure, but also in a new level of energy and wellness, make an appointment to see me, Dr. Honigman, at the same number that you can purchase the supplements, 412-922-9355. And I want to give some credit to the following doctors who've greatly influenced my understanding of and my approach to blood pressure. And they include Dr. Joel Furman. He wrote a book called The End of Heart Disease. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, his book was Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And Michael Greger wrote a book called How Not to Die. And finally, my disclaimer. This information is provided for educational purposes only. It's not designed to diagnose, treat, or cure any health conditions. The United States Food and Drug Administration have not evaluated statements about this health topic or any of my suggested supplement recommendations. So I hope you all enjoyed and learned something from this presentation. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Wow, great information, Dr. Honigman. Thank you so much for being here. Um, there was a few questions, if you don't mind, if I sure. can ask you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, what do you think the best path is to relax in order to be able to reduce blood pressure? Okay. Whoever uh, gave that question is not going to like my answer. <laughs> okay. And that's because for each individual, it's going to be different. I absolutely recommend that you tune into my presentation on uh, stress management and how to have it work in your favor this Wednesday coming at one o'clock. I mean, some of the things that we use is uh, I personally like to use uh, diaphragmatic breathing, uh, meditation. Uh, I love taking walks in the woods and being pretty much one with uh, nature. I call that Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing. Uh, certain supplements I highly recommend. Uh, I personally like L-theanine and holy basil. Uh, lots of other people like Calm Day. Uh, magnesium should be included in that and probably B vitamins because oftentimes the, the adrenal glands are not functioning properly and the B vitamins are essential for uh, every aspect of the adrenal cascade. <clears throat> 
I would uh, recommend for some people journaling. Is it a very good thing? Essential oils. I will be going over some of them in my presentation. So there are many, many different ways that you can learn to manage stress and have it work in your favor. Something I'm going to be talking about uh, during that presentation is that, you know, the only thing that we're actually born with that we're afraid of is the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. So everything else is learned. If we've learned to be afraid, then we can learn not to be afraid. You probably are familiar with the study <clears throat> where they took the, the six month old babies when they could start to crawl and they yes. would put them on a glass top yes. and it was solid, right? And the baby yes. would go out and crawl yeah. across. And then it, it looked like visually though, that you were going to fall off a cliff. And at a right. certain point in that baby's development, it would stop right. and be like, whoa, I'm going to fall. Yes. So it wasn't anything that they could teach them, right? So that's such right. a, a great uh, reminder that we are taught most of the things to be stressed right. about. Yes, right? loud noises and, is loud noises make sense, right? If an animal's coming yeah. at you and barking and things like that, you need to, you know, to to take notice. But other than that, you know, I mean, some of the things absolutely we need to be afraid of, but you know, a lot of the things that we're afraid of that we don't need to be can be reversed. Right. So great, great information. Thank you so much. And when are you coming back? When's your next lecture? People are asking. Wednesday at one o'clock. And that will be on stress management and how to have it work in your favor, how to have stress work in your favor. Well, awesome. Tune in guys, one o'clock on Wednesday for Dr. Honigman, getting stress to work in your favor. Thank you so much. Visit the Thank Wine you, and Wellness Christ. Center. Make an appointment with Dr. Honigman. You will not be sorry. <laughs> Thanks again, Very Tracy. Nice. Everybody have a great day.